the time has come for you to leave. The call of adventure beckons. Bless Unleashed is a Korean MMORPG released to consoles on March 12, 2020 from a developer called Round 8 Studios. And published by Bandai Namco that runs off the Unreal Engine, Blessed Unleashed officially came to PC through Steam on August 6th, 2021. Blessed Unleashed is derivative of a Korean-only MMORPG game that was announced in 2011 to run off the Unreal Engine 3 from a company called Area Games, oh god, that was only called Bless. Yet when Area Games decided that they would cancel the Western release of the game, a company called Neo is, oh my god got a hold of the title and plan to rebuild the game for Unreal Engine 4 and release it in 2018. Now when the 2018 version of the game came out it was so bad and so ill received that the developer decided to scrap it all together and start a new game in a new engine and they called it Blessed Unleashed. So now that all that rubbish is out of the way, uh, let's begin, shall we? So the game loads up to a vista of a castle with some guy crouched down in front of a horse. So yeah, I press start and select new character. First we've got Crusader who looks like a paladin or a tank. And as a Crusader you can be a male or female human as well as another race called Epin who go by a gender classified as self-identified, whatever the hell that means. Then you've got your Berserker who can be this big cringe cat race called Varg. You can select either male or female. Of course, you've got your mandatory ranger class with your mandatory elf specific race selection. <sighs> I mean, at least it's not female elves, you know, because otherwise I might not even play this at all. So next we've got a mage class, which consists of human and elf options, male and female available for both. On to the assassin class who can be elves and that's it, which is something I do not understand. Lastly, we've got the priest who can be either human or the seriously cringe Ippin race. Uh, maybe these racial limitations have lore reasons that I don't know yet. Uh, all I know is that I don't like it. So we decided to go with Berserker, so that means we have to be the big cringe cat people, the Varg. So let's check out the character creator. This is an extremely well fleshed out and robust character creator with most of the sliders that you'd be looking for, save a few hair ones. Really think uh, Black Desert Online with this one. We've even got a wide variety of voices to choose from here. I'll go first. Be honorable. But Hold on, I will help you. Don't get in my way. Something must be done. Pathetic. Would you like to try a jelly I made out of slime? Small? How rude. Whatever the truth. I gotta say, pretty impressed with this. So first things first, we're greeted with this preview cutscene. Let's see if it's any good. It's probably not, but let's check it out. Where the light ends. A black blade shall split the sky. And Luminous will return to sow the seeds of shadow once more. Famine and decay will follow in her wake. And the lash of war will be unleashed. Cries of despair will fill the air. And herald the coming of the undying. An ancient seal will be broken. And an army of chaos shall rise from the breach. 
only a bearer of the lantern may be able to hold darkness at the door. The die has been cast, and Luminous awoken. Before the goddess of darkness can conquer all. Go forth and find the fragments of the gods. So basically it looks like a big GG fuck off Death Knight mommy god has awoken and she rolled critical hit on the planet in which you live. And now it's time for you to go and venture forth with your party. So they start us off in the little tutorial where some old guy in a robe is watching over us like from a distance and then there's also this woman who's guiding us through. We defeat a few monsters and then a big monster at the end of the tutorial. Combat's really simple and tied right to the left and right mouse buttons as well as the 1 through 4 keys. It's really simple and fun. I really enjoyed it. We awake in a bed apparently after having some terrible nightmares only to be greeted by a little Ippin who is apparently our friend or something like that. So he says it's festival day and we're supposed to attend the white flame before he bolts away all piss and vinegar. So the atmosphere here is really really good and I'm really liking what I'm seeing not to mention the music here is extremely warm so let's take a quick listen. Call me old school or whatever the hell you want, but this is how I like my MMOs to start and stay. I won't get my hopes up though. L look at this lady, you know she's just talking a bunch of shit. Look at her, you know she's like, oh, oh yeah, Tom, that no good rotten piece of shit, not worth a single fuck. And then this guy's just egging her on because he knows, he, he knows. He wants a little of the old in out, in out, you know. So we tend the flame of Telerion, and then Foyd tells us that we should probably talk to the High Priestess Demia about that awful dream we just awoke from. Then he fucks off at the speed of woe again. So we proceed to the festival, but not before having a bit of a get down with our bad selves, if you will. So for some reason I'm extremely fond of this opening experience even though this lady isn't cooking anything in the pan but let's move on from that. And I can't tell you why, uh, might have been what I was going through IRL at the time when I first played this or any number of things but all I know is that I, oh my god, what the piss? What's the, what's the rating on this shit again? I mean I'm not complaining but the, don't kids play this? What the hell? Uh, who makes this again? Really though, the densely packed nature of this starting area lends it an air of competence? I don't know, I say that now until I hit that old stale part that kicks up a bunch of stagnated fart odor like plopping down on that old couch your friends were blowing hot nacho cheese farts into the day before. What the shit is going on here? Are those cats? What? Why? What the hell is this? We talk to this awesome looking knight and he tells us if we want to be a big strong man like him one day we need to go and talk to Don Diego of House Sorza so that we can become an adventurer. Over here we got a priestess healing the citizens for the festival which is pretty cool. I'm definitely liking what I'm seeing so far and the game is visually gorgeous. So we toss a coin into the fountain of Telerion and it gives us a healing boon effect which is also a pretty cool little touch they added in. 
I have a chat to the High Priestess Demia and tell of our horrific nightmares, and she tells us to just simmer down Hun and meet her after the festival so we can discuss it. Uh, then we talk to Don Diego of House Sorsa, who tells us that we were an orphan and have an adventuring air about us. And should we want to pursue that calling, feel free to look him up, and I think we will do that. So Don Diego says he should return to the temple and turns around to leave. And I usually like to watch these sequences because I like to see if they're animated or not. This situation usually will let you know how serious the developers are about the quality of their game and yep, disappeared. Okay. So we head back to Foy and he tells us that we need to go and find a guy named Ruben, but not before flexing and showing off a bit with some of our compatriots. So we find Ruben awkwardly crouched behind a pretty small little ledge here, kind of out in the open, spying on some guys called the Faceless. Which is already a lie because I can clearly see that these guys have faces. So we step two centimeters away from Ruben in order to spy on these guys who Ruben think is going to show him up in his troop act tonight. It's not the festival, it's, apparently he's in a, an acting troupe and these guys are his rivals, or so he thinks. But what's really going on is something much more dark entailing a dark goddess. So we go back and tell Ruben, but he's an idiot, so he still thinks this is about some acting troupe. So we instead tell Foy, who says it's no biggity, and Demia will proceed to lay the fuck smack. We enter the temple where Demia is, and I'm instantly getting like year 2000 Final Fantasy Underwater Temple vibes, which is like pretty super duper cool. So we let Demia know what we've heard and she tells us that they've come for us and the end is near and we need to run out and tell Don Diego. So we tell Don Diego that Demia says that they are coming for us and we need to be prepared. To which Don Diego responds, doubt it. Then proceeds to mansplain how she's just flying off the handle and everything will be okay. But he will send a few soldiers just in case. You know how women are, right? Directly after that conversation, we're treated to this cutscene. Halt! State your business! So, this is where you've been hiding. Gideon! Do you remember how we parted all those years ago? It was the will of Viscera. Of course it was. My god, however, desires something different. So basically some asshole shows up with an entourage all dressed in the starter outfits from Black Desert Online and he uses the power of an enchanted D20 to put down the guards and proceeds to roll a 20 onto Mia's face making her unalive. They're welcome to try. So with Demia down, the camera cuts back to the festival which is under siege by this strange group of people who summon demons. Yep. So we fight back the hordes of hellhounds and shadow spawn. Foy risks his life to eat a fireball to the nostrils and before they can get us, Don Diego swoops down from Stormwind on his griffin and quickly clicks the flight path over to West Falls and we barely escape.
the next thing we know, we awake on a farm. We have a chat to the person who owns the farm, Marco. He tells us that we fell off the griffin with Don Diego and he left us here to recover from our injuries. Before anything else, we should probably get a little food in us, so he bids us to go speak with his son, Giovanni. Giovanni gives us some soup and tells us that we've been asleep for an entire week yes. and that our griffin has been injured from when we fell and we need to go heal it right now. You mean the griffin that fell more than seven days ago? And you didn't help it? What kind of sick freaks are you people? I mean, who leaves a mythical creature like that writhing in pain for an entire- Look at it! Anyway. So, I, I need to get the hell out of here as soon as possible, but before that I need to change my key bindings because they're, they're just not right. So, let's see how convoluted the hotkey system is. Works fine. Immediately upon leaving the farmstead, we get a quest. Can you guess what the quest is? Did you guess killing slimes? Because you're wrong. It was wolves. Hmm? You were miles off. Shame on you. So before we set off on our grandiose journey, we meet Giovanni at a nearby gravesite to pay respects to uh, something, his mom, something like that. And Marco tells us how to get to Don Diego's estate. So we should be on our way, but it turns out that Giovanni all of a sudden wants to go with us because of the fact that he lives on a farm and he doesn't want to be living on a farm anymore, or something like that, or involved with living on a farm, something like that. So he wants to leave. So after very little resistance from his father, Marco, he's allowed to tag along and we make off to Karzekor City, the capital. To my delight, a friend of Giovanni's intercepts him before we can set off and lets him know that they had shit to do. So they'll meet us up ahead, which is fine because I gotta admit I did not want to be going around with cringe farmer son foe today. So we advance the road a bit and come up on a Dark Souls pyre and a Sorzenite making all the sex noises that he ever could possibly make. As well as another player, which is a pretty lovely surprise seeing us as this is the first one I've seen for the whole time and he looks pretty badass. The Sorzenite tells me that there's a Wolf King nearby and we're to steer clear of it. And he must be out of his goddamn mind if he thinks we're going to steer clear of a- Oh, 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 yeah, okay, there's no one else here? Alright, yeah, well, maybe we'll, uh, we'll come back to the Wolf King. That's I'm fine. Anyway, after disciplining some kids who are ripping on a dude who's afraid of the wolf, we come upon these two characters who are discussing the morality of this guy riding that goat, which is hilarious. We come across some people who are accosted by the faceless bandits and she asks us to clear them out and save the potatoes. So we hop right on that and we find this w weird girl trapped by with a parrot. She says the parrot will eat her if we don't get it some food. Whatever bro, whatever. So we get her parrot the food and she thanks us for saving her life before we're on our way. What even is this? So after being given the opportunity to buy our first mount for fairly cheap, which is pretty cool, we arrive at Karzegor Harbor and it's besieged by pissed off citizens that are angry because they've been giving their fish to the faceless bandits. So we take care of them and bring peace back to the harbor and move along to find a bard serenading a dog. 
I don't know why he's serenading a dog, but here it is and it is what it is. We take some fish scraps from this fisher and trade it to this cat for a bottle of wine which we then trade to a nearby beggar for a sack of grain. Fair trade if you ask me. Uh, we approach the gates of Karzaker and cut the line where they've been queued to get in. The guard tells us to fuck off which we reply we have a delivery of fish from the harbor which needs to get in ASAP because it needs to get on ice. He decides that he's going to let us in and we get our first glimpse of Karzakar and it's like a knockoff Kalfion that just got a last minute reconstruction and turned into Uldah. We encounter a guard named Rogers who tells us the Manzini estate is under siege so we need to go and make it stop because Don Diego is there. So we rush the estate and smash faces until we get to Don Diego. When we get there, Don Diego is with the lady that was in our nightmare and she pulls out a D20 and calls it Prana. It implodes due to us just being that badass, of course, and now apparently we're something called Pyreborn. Hmm. Apparently, Pyreborn are children blessed by the goddess Pisera. Pisera, Pisera. The God of Order. And Priestess Demia was collecting us. So, supposedly, this is what she's saying. She would like us to investigate the attack we suffered at Telerian Island because what the fuck else are we going to do? And we need to get her staff and meet her at a farm called Galapas. She'll teleport us near to where her staff is, which she does. So before we proceed to pursue the staff, let's take a look at the cash shop because they're introducing the system called Star Seeds and it seems we need them to enhance and repair our gear and weapons, alluding to the obvious inevitability that your gear is going to break when upgrading, which is lame. Now there's only a certain amount of Star Seeds that you can get depending on your level per day and the price increases exponentially when you pass that cap. So. Basically, if you want the best stuff, you're going to have to either straight up buy star seeds or buy the money packs they sell in order so you can upgrade your weapons and armor and then repair it, as well as many of your other tools. Can I help? Well, anyway, uh, I'm going to exit the shop because it's making me kind of sad. And we accept a quest from this Shibiki cat thing who lets us know that there's a racist guard inside who won't let him into the library because hey, he's a cat. You Don't you worry, my man. There is no better guy for the job. There is nothing I love more than shit caking racist and punches. So we charge into the library ready to bust some heads and we find a bunch of dorks standing outside a room with two giant cricket moles inside. I tell them to hold my burr and rush in and crack some fucking heads. So after saving their goddamn lives I emerge from the room and they all look at me like I'm stupid except for one guy who applauds. Yeah, don't mind me, I just jumped into imminent danger to save your goddamn worthless asses. After putting down the crickets, we searched the room for the staff, but it's not there because some asshole took it. He left behind a bunch of fertilizer that glows red apparently, and that's why the crickets are so big and why they were there in the first place. And there's more going on here than meets the eye, clearly. Be vigilant. So now it's off to the Arcane Agricultural Department, which sounds ridiculous but not before finding our racist and telling him that he needs to go ahead and simmer down or we're going to tell. He says, all right, the little Shibiki can come in, he guesses, and he gets to keep his life faux today, I guess. We bump into one of the agricultural apprentices and she's got books laying all over the ground. We help her clean them and read a few to uncover a ploy about someone spiking the fertilizer with prana in order to 
counter an ensuing famine, I guess. Apparently that's making the bugs freak out, and there's also tell of a new sponsor for all this fertilizer and material. Now we encounter Marco again from the farm. It turns out in his past he was a well-known mercenary that went by Marco Morta. Uh, he's out here looking for Giovanni who never returned home since he left with us from the farm. You guys remember that? Marco seems to think uh, whatever he's looking for and whatever we're looking for somehow link up. So we're going to go and work together to find what we need. We find the person who took the staff we needed and he's being accosted by some faceless. They're apparently working together with him, but now the agriculturalist doesn't want to help him anymore since the bugs are flipping out. So they got mad and we have to jump in. After saving his ass, he gives us the staff and admits to helping spike the fertilizer with prana for the good of the land or whatever. So the staff is broken, of course. So we need to get it fixed and we head over to the ancient amphitheater to find out who can do that for us. We find the guy and he tells us stuff needs to be fixed and he needs stuff to fix it so we have to go get stuff. Before we actually get what he needs, we encounter an opportunity to explore the crafting system and actually craft an upgrade with materials that we already had on us. This was great and certainly will make my tits perk up when I see those materials out there in the open world. The materials we need are being guarded by an undead gladiator boss fight, which was super fun, and he had dual daggers, which is pretty awesome. After we take him down and we get what we need, we can be on our way and we meet a few cat people who teach us fishing, and I love fishing. We come across the kid who was scared of the wolf back in the beginning and this time he's afraid of a troll. He wants us to kill the troll so we run over and uh... Yeah, it's just not gonna happen. We arrive at the farm, Orfina told us to investigate, and they tell us the mole crickets are freaking out and we need to make them fuck off. So with crickets fucked off, they send us deeper into the cricket mine, den lair, whatever thing, and we find Gideon, the guy who killed, uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Demia. Gideon confirms his plan to make the crickets freak out and leave so we can take down the donkey henchman and find Cosimo's dead body. He was to meet us here via instruction of Orfina. Supposedly, according to Orfina, Gideon is engineering the famine in order to use prana to, to do a thing. Who knows? Who the fuck knows? Now we know where they'll strike next. Pirlo's farm and they want to resurrect actual dead people, so we're to get our asses over there now. On the way there, we meet this asshole bard again who's still serenading the same dog, but this time he wants us to help him abandon it. Wow, what an asshole. We also meet this guy who's apparently a farmer and has been watching too much Friday Night Live, so he thinks he can go and be an adventurer. He challenges us to a fight. I mean, I guess it was a fight. But shortly after, he simmers on down and decides Farmer's Son is actually perhaps more lit than he may have previously conceived. We get to the farm and can you believe it, this guy again? Really? This time he wants us to get him mummy bandages to wear? 
so that he can fool the dog and abandon it? Like, d dude, at this point you just have a dog. Like, hold your fucking L, it is what it is, you know? Me sitting here writing this script right now, it's pretty obvious, at least to me, that I'm pretty invested in what's going on with this goddamn bard and this goddamn dog. Upon arriving at the site near the farm, we're greeted by this lost commander, Wraith Guy, who tells us how the Faceless came and riled up all his ghostly bros, bringing them back to life with Prana, and now he needs us to help simmer them back down. When I opened my eyes, I remembered I died in the battlefield many years ago. A power beyond our comprehension, the same kind that is quiet. Woke us from our slumber. It's working! The dead are rising! By the gods! They're out of control! Run! Foul magic has gripped the minds of my brethren. They're stricken with madness, forever reliving the horror of our last battle. Please, you must end our torment. Orphina says she knows how to fix this shit, and we need to help get her to this platform where she can cast a spell. So we escort her deeper into the graveyard, where a Geist Warden boss attacks. This fight was actually pretty fun, I really enjoyed that one. Morphina casts her spell and makes the wreaths calm the hell down so we can leave. We meet her back at the Manzini estate and she lets us know that it's time for our first blessing. So we gotta go back to the graveyard and kill a boss, uh, as well as another couple of highwaymen in order to receive the blessing. We get to the graveyard and luckily there's already a few people there fighting the boss and we jump in and beat its ass. With asses beat, we can now see the two highwaymen. They're just a basic ranger and tank combo. One backs up and takes pop shots while the other one gets up close and personal with the shield. Pretty cool fight. All right, that's enough dicking around. Let's talk some serious business here. I was willing to give it a chance, but this game's lack of voice acting is goddamn ridiculous. And I understand they probably don't have a whole lot of money after remarketing the game eight goddamn times, but really, come on. I'm a firm believer that Anything important will always be voice acted, and I'm not about to piss on everything I love for Bless Unchained, or whatever it's called. It's not like the voice animation they had was even bad. It was pretty good. Albeit one or two lines. And the equipment enhanced system. Oh my god. I mean, it's something I don't even understand on a base level. The way it's presented makes me not even want to try to learn it. It's kind of like getting a Porsche for your birthday, and it has tribal flames all over it in Anime Girls. Only it's not vinyl. It's paint. I mean, did they even look around the room before they put this shit out? Games like Final Fantasy XV and Elder Scrolls Online had been out for years already. You'd think if you want to be in a competitive market with titans like that, you'd at least have base requirements like voice acting or not being paid to win. It baffles me how stupid these developers must think that we are, you know? Who looks at two different houses that are essentially the same price and goes, Oh yeah, I want to live in the shittier, older, smaller one that's next to the liquor store. And you know what's weird? That's not to say that I don't like this game. Because I do, and it's weird to say, but... I, I do. I know it has something to do with me wanting to like it even before it released, but... It has a certain charm to it. Let's take the combat, for example. It's not extremely convoluted with 20 different hotkeys and this and that. It's simple, easy to understand, and it makes it fun. But what the fuck do I know? I'm a Guild Wars 2 Weaver main. I really don't have a problem with the way the world was crafted, the graphics, or the combat. That stuff's all really good and the story isn't even terrible. As far as I'm concerned, those things are what you really need to make an MMO good. Save voice acting, but don't get me started on that again. But when you start adding things like monetized enhancement systems, which really entails the viability of your entire game... Uh, if you can't upgrade the way you want and progress, then the hell's the point, you know? 
Not everyone can afford to dump assholes of money into a goddamn MMO to upgrade gear, but the devs didn't give two shits about that, did they? Take a game like Guild Wars 2, for example. If you need to upgrade your gear, you've two options. They'll let you straight up upgrade any of your gear for a decent little amount of gold, most of the things you can either buy from other players, or you can just go ahead and earn through gameplay yourself. They never make you purchase some currency like star seeds that they've made up in order to get IRL money for you to progress your character and your gear. It's totally and completely understandable for a player to just straight up quit the game when they find out they can't have the gear that they want unless they swipe a credit card, think about it. And the craziest part of all of this is the developers know the game is failing. Right now Steam has less than 500 people and they won't even at least try to reform the game a little bit. To me what that says is it's shit. They know it's shit, they don't care it's shit. They're not gonna do anything about it. This is the eighth time it came out and no one's fixed it. At that point it's clear that you're just trying to milk the gamer for as much as possible before your game doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, that's enough of my bullshit. It's time for me to get out of here and go get that blessing so we can be unleashed. The blessings are templates with different passive effects on them. For example, the one we start with has synergies between our combo attacks and skills. The one we've just gotten, the Mark of the Wolf, consists of passive effects, buffs, and damage mitigation when you do a certain thing. So now that we've been blessed unchained, we can head back to the Mazzini estate and speak to Orfina. She tells us, now that we've been blessed, we'll be able to twink our way through any future problems because we're just that strong now. Next, Don Diego has a little task for us. We're to parlay with Marco and ride west to deliver a message to King Rodrigo of Navarra, warning him of the faceless threat. Then we can meet him at a bar to discuss our next move. On the way, we come across a large scale battle where everyone's grunting. You'd think to hear some screams or yells or any kind of orders. I don't know, something grammatically audible, but I don't know, what are you gonna do, I guess? We resurrect some dead horses with the power of adventurer, and then we get to see the majesty of nature in play. Now I know this goat isn't supposed to be here, but you, I know you guys have seen those goats that stand aside the almost flat cliff faces. Nature is healing. We reach Castle Navarra and tell them we have a message for the king from House Sorza. The little dipshit of a guard says that the king isn't seeing anyone and we'll need to give our letter to the Chamberlain of House Sorza. She says that the king is away at war, but she will let him know and we're to run back and tell Don Diego. We run into our bard friend again who seems to have successfully abandoned that puppy for shame. And also, what's with this audio loop? What were they thinking? Uh, this very bouncy lady here wants to give us a job, and I'm not sure what kind of job she has in mind, but I'm entirely sure what kind of job I have in mind if you're picking up what I'm putting down. Hmm? We catch Don Diego outside the bar who asks us if we've delivered the letter and then tells us to go help Marco stop the bandits from stealing the mounts from the Empire troops in some remote village and on my way there, I come across an everlasting ore node. Shortly after, I get mauled by a goddamn mountain lion and die. This is bullshit. Nah, it's okay, it's only my first death. I just need to keep a better eye on my health bar, I guess. We get to where they've been stealing all the mounts from the Empire, and they've been besieged by trolls. So we run straight up to the bandit leader and proceed to smash face. With that asshole down, we can grab the battle plans and be on our way. We head back to Marco who tells us the battle plans ain't enough. 
Uh, he knows of another bandit taken captive by the gnolls, and we need to hurry to find them before they get eaten. And he'll take the battle plans back to the Chamberlain of House Sorza for us. While en route, we come across Clarice, the parrot lady, again. And she's tied up again. And she's not asking to be freed. Again. Instead, she wants us to go find a deer. So, we find a specific deer in a sea of similarly named deer to complete the quest. She gives us the title Bambi Chaser and we just walk away. We encounter this lad Hector who's just seen the Harpy Queen swoop down and snatch our mark before GGing a bunch of gnolls. He points us in the direction of the guy who knows more about where our mark might be. Before we can be on our way, we spot Aiden, the scared little kid again. And this time he's scared of three bandits who are skinned the exact same way as our last two highwaymen that we fought. And they're sporting the names of the three musketeers, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. Uh, this Sorzenite says he has a trial for Sorzenites, which I guess we're being considered as now. And we need to queue up in matchmaking right away. So while we're queued up, we're going to keep on keeping on because I'm not getting any hopes up of actually starting the dungeon. So we find the guy who knows about the Harpy Queen and where the guy we're looking for might be. He says the Harpies be tripping and we need to make them simmer down. We end up finding the guy's body and a note on it saying they're going to attack a nearby ranch for the horses. So we rush over there to warn them. We tell Gilberto Castro they're about to attack and he says they're here now. So we gotta fight these assholes. We take down their leader and Gilberto says he managed to capture a bandit alive. Gilberto can't interrogate him because the guy used to work here at the farm, so we need to do it. We interrogate this guy and he immediately snitches on some lord named Guiscardo, who's fortifying a base up north. Apparently this guy wants to rebel against the Empire or something like that. We tell Gilberto and he says the guy was a leader of a previous Navarran rebellion and we're dealing with a rebel army. He says he will go to warn the city while we Leroy Jenkins our way into the stronghold. Upon arrival at the fortress we crouch down behind a few old boxes and proceed to eavesdrop on some of the bandit leaders. They say that since we've busted up their little plans at the farm they'll instead kill the Chamberlain of House Sorza, Tatiana before we're noticed and need to defend ourselves. On our way out, we notice a cage and... Oh no, not this shit again, really? We find Clarice, the parrot girl, and she's in a cage again. She asks us to get her her thing. So we go and get the thing, bring it back to her, and leave her in the cage again. I'm not really sure what the joke's supposed to be here, but... I gotta tell you that I don't get it. We run back to the cemetery urgently in order to save Tatiana, the Chamberlain of House Sorza whose life hangs in the balance, but not before a few side quests. With that out of the way, we arrive at the cemetery to find Tatiana, to no surprise, already under siege by the assassin. Tatiana, being an archmage, is more than able to protect herself. She says with Guisardo returned, the threat has just increased exponentially and we need to go and tell the king directly. While talking to Tatiana, a dungeon pops and obscures the main focal point of the screen, which really is something you think they'd have looked at before they released the game. It's like if your fucking gas ran out in your car, and instead of a little flashing light, they put, you ran out of gas, you donkey, over the windshield, and you crashed and died. When we get done talking with Tatiana, a cutscene immediately starts playing, and the dungeon confirmation UI is still on the goddamn screen. So we finally get to experience our first dungeon. Which really isn't even a dungeon, it's just a two-on-one boss fight, and there's some asshole in here one-hitting everything. That asshole aside, I was expecting a dungeon, not a basic boss fight where you fight and then just leave. What were they thinking? En route to the king's camp, we encounter an old defector, Brightfang, 
who is a companion of Marco, under attack from his own kind. We lend him a paw and he tells us he wants to help the king with his war against these other gnolls for some reason. We reach the encampment to find the king who's in a war with some nearby gnolls and tell him of the current events, as well as of Brightfang, the gnoll defector who wants to help. He says, alrighty, but if you bring a gnoll in this camp, the soldiers are going to freak out, so you better go speak with the general. The general says he might be inclined to let the gnoll enter the camp, but first we have to do a few things for him, like kill a few gnolls and free someone who's been captured by a gnoll. After we fuck up the gnolls and save the merchant, we can go back to the general. Now, with Brightfang on our side, we have a little extra information and seems ready to launch an attack and the king himself decides to initiate. Let's take a look at the stutters in this cutscene because it wasn't on film, you wouldn't believe me. I'm not dealing with subpar computer parts here either guys, this shit is just bad. What we achieve here today will be the stuff of legend! Let us march towards victory! For Navarra! <laughs> So we crush a few of the smaller ones as well as a few commanders before the big chonky boy comes out swinging a big fucking buffalo leg or some shit. Super duper fun fight though. Blessed Unleash is it's not a bad game. It isn't. The foundations of the graphics, controls, combat, and audio, save the voice acting since there's very little, are all just fine. This has the potential to be a really good game. The problem is the monetization tacked on it by NeoWiz and Bandai. That's what the problem is. If I knew that I could continue my journey as I am now without having to go into my pockets or dedicate thousands of hours of my life just so I could gear up and play all the content it has to offer, I would keep playing. To me, this game has a certain charm to it, and I hate the fact that I know continuing just isn't worth it unless I am prepared to spend X amount of real world dollars. And whether you're prepared to accept that or not, it is the reality of Bless Online. I've heard all kinds of arguments about this game. People say it's pay to win, some people say it's not. But as far as I'm concerned, if you can buy gold from a cash shop and sell things from a cash shop to get your gold, and then buy the best Feels gear with like that money, that's pay to win. And it is what it is. And to be fair, it's not like you cannot get all the stuff you want on your own without paying for it. But understand this. You know another game where you can get all the best gear on your own and you don't have to pay any money? Black Desert Online. Do with that information what you will. Let's take a few seconds and read some reviews from Steam. Played it on Xbox? Still playing it now. 9 out of 10. 1,276 hours played. New World Waiting Room. 3,562 hours played. Before I played this game, I had a small penis, no girlfriend, and no will to live. None of these things have changed, but the game's pretty good. The combat is probably the best I've played in any RPG. The UI and systems are easy to learn and navigate. I think the biggest reason why people stopped after the tutorial is the fact that the game is very poorly optimized. It feels more like a single player experience with bits of co-op thrown into it. The main quest and side quest can keep you busy for a while until the main quests start requiring world boss kills in order to progress. At that point, you would be basically stalking world chat waiting for that one dude who's running world bosses for what I would guess is collecting crafting materials. I don't know. I don't care. I just want to continue with the story. That or you could join one of the maybe three active guilds and ask for help. Assuming they have space and are willing to recruit players that only log in for an hour or two a day just to chill. 121 hours on record. Wallet unleashed. Forced PvP after level 30. You can toggle off PvP, but this only makes it so that you can't attack other players, but they can still attack you. Pay to win. Same developer as Bless Online, although they attempted to confuse people with a studio name change. After level 30, need pay real money for avoid PvP. I'd rather wait New World release on 28 September. Never played a game where you pay real money per hour to have no PvP. 117 hours at time of review and I really cannot recommend this game. 
Between Unhelpful Community and the other garbage mechanics, this game very quickly lost its luster to me. It was fun as heck at first. Not that I'm stuck waiting for Marketplace to come back. I guess he's waiting for the Marketplace and it's on a timer, oh, oh, like a weekly timer. Waiting for weekly resets and saw how people are once get to level 35. I'm just not interested anymore. Once some other games drop in a week or so, this game's getting uninstalled. Funny. The review about the Force PvP is absolutely crazy, but I gotta say, I agree with every last one of those reviews. Alright, let's go over some pros and cons then. Pros. The game has a decent story on it, and the visuals are not bad at all. Sound effects are just fine, and the architecture and zone layout are pretty cool. You have a decent variety of classes to choose from, with what looks like a good amount of skills. Easy to learn and understand combat-wise. As fishing. Cons. Lack of voice acting. Predatory cash shop implementations. Time-gated resources unless you pay. Forced PvP unless you pay. Low player population. And you know the problem with games that have lower player populations? At that point, it's not about if your game is good or bad. It's that people think it's bad. So they're not gonna come because they think it's bad and you already have a lower player population. So... Listen, if you like Bless Unbound, you don't need to listen to any of this bullcrap. Just keep playing your game. Something? Keep enjoying what you're doing. Nothing's wrong with that. Hell, I really like this game. But where I draw the line is Developers thinking they can just treat us like some sort of cash cows to be milked? I'd be willing to keep on playing the game if I didn't see Neowiz in my head every time I close my eyes, rubbing their hands together like some sort of rapper who just dropped the mixtape. But, no matter what, Bless Unleashed will sadly always have a place in my heart. What about you guys? Hey, thanks for checking out my video guys. I really appreciate that and I really appreciate the clicks. So I sincerely hope to see you guys in the next one. Blame Blast out.